Section zero, the preface to Amoretti and Epithalamia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. Amoretti and Epithalamia by Edmund Spencer. Section one. Preface by Francis James Child. These sonnets furnish us with a circumstantial and very interesting history of Spencer's second courtship, which, after many repulses, was successfully terminated by the marriage celebrated in the Epithalamion. As these poems were entered in the Stationer's Register on the 19th of November, 1594, we may infer that they cover a period of time extending from the end of 1592 to the summer of 1594. It is possible, however, that these last dates may be a year too late, and that Spencer was married in 1593. We cannot be sure of the year, but we know from the 266th verse of the Epithalamion that the day was the Feast of St. Barnabas, June 11th of the Old Style. In the 74th sonnet we are directly told that the lady's name was Elizabeth. In the 61st she is said to be of the brood of angels, heavenly born. From this and many similar expressions, interpreted by the laws of anagram and taken in conjunction with various circumstances which do not require to be stated here, it may be inferred that her name was Nagel. End of preface. Section 1 of Amoretti and Epithalamion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. Section 1. 1. Happy ye leaves, when as those lily hands which hold my life in their dead doing might shall handle you, and hold in love's soft bands like captives trembling at the victor's sight, and happy lines on which with starry light those lamping eyes will deign sometimes to look and read the sorrows of my dying sprite and happy rhymes bathed in the sacred brook of helicon whence she derived it is when ye behold that angel's blessed look my soul's long lacquered food my heaven's bliss leaves lines and rhymes seek her to please alone whom if he please I care for other none. 2. Unquiet thought, whom at the first I bred of inward bale of my love pine at heart, and sithens have with sighs and sorrows fed, till greater than my womb thou walks enough. Break forth at length out of the inner part in which thou lurkest like to vipers brood, and seek some succour both to ease my smart and also to sustain thyself with food. But if in presence of that fairest proud thou chance to come, fall lowly at her feet, and with meek humblest and afflicted mood pardon for thee, and grace for me entreat, which if she grant, then live and my love cherish, if not, die soon, and I with thee will perish. 3. The sovereign beauty which I do admire, witness the world how worthy to be praised. The light whereof hath kindled heavenly fire in my frail spirit, by her from baseness raised. That being now with her huge brightness dazed, base thing I can no more endure to view. But looking still on her, I stand amazed at wondrous sight of so celestial hue. So when my tongue would speak her praises due, it stop it is with thought's astonishment, and when my pen would write her titles true, it ravished is with fancy's wonderment. Yet in my heart I then both speak and write the wonder that my wit cannot indict. 4. Note. Dumpish. Mournful. New Year. Forth looking out of Janus gate doth seem to promise hope of new delight, and bidding gold adieu, 
this passive date bids all old thoughts to die in dumpish sprite and calling forth out of sad winter's night fresh love that long hath slept in cheerless bower wills him awake and soon about him dight his wanton wings and darts of deadly power for lusty spring now in his timely hour is ready to come forth him to receive and warns the earth with divers coloured flower to deck herself and her fair mantle weave then you fair flower in whom fresh youth doth reign prepare yourself new love to entertain five note tried found rudely thou wrongest my dear heart's desire in finding fault with her too portly pride the thing which i do most in her admire is of the world unworthy most envied for in those lofty looks is close implied scorn of base things and stain of foul dishonour threatening rash eyes which gaze on her so wide that loosely they ne dare to look upon her such pride is praise such portliness is honour that bold and innocence bears in her eyes and her fair countenance like a goodly banner spreads in defiance of all enemies was never in this world aught worthy tried without some spark of such self-pleasing pride six note entire inward be not dismayed that her unmoved mind doth still persist in her rebellious pride such love not like to lusts of baser kind the harder one the firmer will abide the durful oak whose sap is not yet dried is long ere it conceive the kindling fire but when it once doth burn it doth divide great heat and makes his flames to heaven aspire so hard it is to kindle new desire in gentle breast that shall endure for ever deep is the wound that dints the parts entire with chaste effects that not but death can sever then think not long in taking little pain to knit the knot that ever shall remain seven fair eyes the mirror of my mazed heart what wondrous virtue is contained in you the which both life and death forth from your dart into the object of your mighty view for when ye mildly look with lovely hue then is my soul with life and love inspired but when ye lower or look on me askew then do i die as one with lightning fired but since that life is more than death desired look ever lovely as becomes you best that your bright beams of my weak eyes admired may kindle living fire within my breast such life should be the honour of your light such death the sad example of your might eight more than most fair full of the living fire kindled above under the maker near no eyes but joys in which all powers conspire that to the world naught else be counted dear through your bright beams doth not the blinded guest shoot out his darts to base affections wound but angels come to lead frail minds to rest in chaste desires on heavenly beauty bound you frame my thoughts and fashion me within you stop my tongue and teach my heart to speak you calm the storm that passion did begin strong to your cause but by your virtue weak dark is the world where your light shineth never well is he born that may behold you ever nine long while i sought to what i might compare those powerful eyes which lighten my dark sprite yet find i naught on earth to which i dare resemble the image of their goodly light not to the sun for they do shine by night nor to the moon for they are changed never nor to the stars for they have purer sight nor to the fire for they consume not ever nor to the lightning for they still persever nor to the diamond for they are more tender 
nor into crystal, for not may them sever, nor unto glass such baseness mote offend her. Then to the maker's self they like us be, whose light doth lighten all that here we see. 10. Note. Make. Note. Unrighteous Lord of love, what law is this that me thou makest thus tormented be, the whiles she lordeth in licentious bliss of her free will, scorning both thee and me? See how the tyrannous doth joy to see the huge massacres which her eyes do make, and humbled hearts brings captive unto thee, that thou of them mayst mighty vengeance take. But her proud heart do thou a little shake, and that high look with which she doth control all this world's pride, bow to a baser make, and all her faults in thy black book enroll, that I may laugh at her in equal sort as she doth laugh at me, and makes my pain her sport. 11. Note. Ruth. Pity. Daily, when I do seek and sue for peace, and hostages do offer for my truth, she, cruel warrior, doth herself address to battle, and the weary war renewth. It will be moved with reason or with ruth to grant small respite to my restless toil, but greedily her fell intent pursueth of my poor life to make unpitied spoil. Yet my poor life all sorrows to a soil i would her yield her wrath to pacify but then she seeks with torment and turmoil to force me live and will not let me die all pain hath end and every war hath peace but mine no price nor prayer may her cease twelve one day i sought with her heart thrilling eyes to make a truce and terms to entertain all fearless then of so false enemies which sought me to entrap in treason's train so as i then disarmed did remain a wicked ambush which lay hidden long in the close covert of a guileful eyne thence breaking forth did thick about me throng too feeble i to bide the brunt so long was forced to yield myself into their hands who kneecap tiding straight with rigorous wrong have ever since kept me in cruel bands so lady now to you i do complain against your eyes that justice i may gain thirteen in that proud port which her so goodly graceth whiles her fair face she rears up to the sky and to the ground her eyelids low and baseth most goodly temperature ye may descry, mild humbless mixed with awful majesty. For looking on the earth when she was born, her mind remembereth her mortality. But so is fairest, shall to earth return. But that same lofty countenance seems to scorn base thing, and think how she to heaven may climb, treading down earth as loathsome and forlorn that hinders heavenly thoughts with glossy slime. Yet, lowly, still vouchsafe to look on me, such loneliness shall make you lofty be. 14. Note. Peace, fortress. Delay, beleaguer. Return again, my forces late dismayed, under the siege by you abandoned quite. Great shame it is to leave like one afraid so fair a peace for one repulse so light. Against such strong castles needeth greater might than those small forts which ye were wont belay. Such haughty minds, and your to hardy fight, disdain to yield unto the first essay. Bring therefore all the forces that ye may, and lay incessant battery to her heart. Plaints, prayers, vows, ruth, sorrow, and dismay. Those engines can the proudest love convert. And if those fail, fall down and die before her. So dying, live, and living, do adore her. 15. 
ye trade for merchants that with weary toil do seek most precious things to make your gain and both the indias of their treasure spoil what needeth you to seek so far in vain for lo my love doth in herself contain all this world's riches that may far be found if sapphires lo her eyes be sapphires plain if rubies lo her lips be rubies sound if pearls her teeth be pearls both pure and round if ivory her forehead ivory ween if gold her locks are finest gold on ground if silver her fair hands are silver sheen but that which fairest is but few behold her mind adorned with virtues manifold sixteen one day as i unwarily did gaze on those fair eyes my love's immortal light the whiles my astonished heart stood in amaze through sweet illusion of her look's delight i might perceive how in her glancing sight legions of loves with little wings did fly darting their deadly arrows fiery bright at every rash beholder passing by one of those archers closely i did spy aiming his arrow at my very heart when suddenly with twinkle of her eye the damsel broke his misintended dart had she not so done sure i had been slain yet as it was i hardly escaped with pain seventeen note spill spoil the glorious portrait of that angel's face made to amaze weak men's confused skill and this world's worthless glory to embase what pen what pencil can express her fill for though he colours could devise at will and deep his learned hand at pleasure guide lest trembling it his workmanship should spill yet many wondrous things there are beside the sweet eye glances that like arrows glide the charming smiles that rob sense from the heart the lovely pleasance and the lofty pride cannot express it be by any art a greater craftsman's hand thereto doth need that can express the life of things indeed eighteen note redound overflow the rolling wheel that runneth often round the hardest steel in tract of time doth tear and drizzling drops that often do redound the firmest flint doth in continuance wear yet cannot i with many a drooping tear and long entreaty soften her hard heart that she will once vouchsafe my plaint to hear or look with pity on my painful smart but when i plead she bids me play my part and when i weep she says tears of water and when i sigh she says i know the art and when i wail she turns herself to laughter so do i weep and wail and plead in vain while she as steel and flint doth still remain nineteen the merry cuckoo messenger of spring his trumpet shrill hath thrice already sounded it warns all lovers wait upon their king who now is coming forth with garland crowned with noise whereof the choir of birds resounded their anthem sweet devised of love's praise that all the woods their echoes back rebounded as if they knew the meaning of their lays but amongst them all which did love's honour raise no word was heard of her that most did aught but she his precept proudly disobeys and doth his idle message set at naught therefore o love unless she turn to the ere cuckoo end let her a rebel be twenty in vain i seek and sue to her for grace and do mine humbled heart before a poor for whilst her foot she in my neck doth place and tread my life down in the lowly floor and yet the lion that is lord of power and reigneth over every beast in field in his most pride disdaineth to devour the silly lamb that to his might doth yield but she more cruel and more savage wild than either lion or the lioness 
shames not to be with guiltless blood defiled, but taketh glory in her cruelness. Fairer than fairest, let none ever say that ye were blooded in a yielded prey. 21. Note. Terms. Possibly extremes. Was it the work of nature, or of art, which timbered so the feature of her face that pride and meekness, missed by equal part, do both appear to adorn her beauty's grace? For with mild pleasance which doth pride displace, she to her love doth looker's eyes allure, and with stern countenance back again doth chase their looser looks that stir up lusts and pure. With such strange terms her eyes she doth endure, that with one look she doth my life dismay, and with another doth it straight recure. Her smile me draws, her frown me drives away. Thus doth she train and teach me with her looks. Such art of eyes I never read in books. 22. Note. This Holy Season, Easter. This holy season, fit to fast and pray, men to devotion ought to be inclined. Therefore I likewise, on so holy day, for my sweet saint some service fit will find. The temple fair is built within my mind, in which her glorious image place it is, on which my thoughts do day and night attend, like sacred priests that never think amiss. There I, to her, as the author of my bliss, will build an altar to appease her ire, and on the same my heart will sacrifice, burning in flames of pure and chaste desire. The which vouchsafe, O goddess, to accept, amongst thy dearest relics to be kept. 23. Penelope, for her Ulysses' sake, devised a web her wooers to deceive, in which the work that she all day did make the same at night she did again unreave. Such subtle craft my damsel doth conceive, the importune suit of my desire to shun. For all that I in many days do weave, in one short hour I find by her undone. So when I think to end that I begun, I must begin and never bring to end. For with one look she spills that long I spun and with one word my whole year's work doth rend. Such labour like the spider's web I find, whose fruitless work is broken with least wind. 24. When I behold that beauty's wonderment and rare perfection of each goodly part, of nature's skill the only complement, I honour and admire the maker's art. But when I feel the bitter, baleful smart which her fair eyes unwares do work in me, that death out of their shiny beams do dart, I think that I a new Pandora see, whom all the gods in council did agree into this sinful world from heaven to send, that she to wicked men a scourge should be for all their faults with which they did offend. But since ye are my scourge, I will entreat that for my faults she will me gently beat. 25. How long shall this like dying life endure, and know no end of her own misery, but waste and wear away in terms unsure, twixt fear and hope depending doubtfully? Yet better were at once to let me die, and show the last example of your pride, than to torment me thus with cruelty to prove your power, which I too well have tried. But yet, if in your hardened breast ye bide a close intent at last to show me grace, then all the woes and wrecks which I abide, as means of bliss I gladly will embrace, and wish that more and greater they might be, that greater meed at last may turn to me. 26. Notes. His branches rough, i.e. raw, crude. His pill, peel. Sweet is the rose, but grows upon a brier. Sweet is the juniper, but sharp his brow. 
Sweet is the eglantine, but pricketh near. Sweet is the fir bloom, but his branches rough. Sweet is the cypress, but his rind is rough. Sweet is the nut, but bitter is his pill. Sweet is the broom flower, but yet sour enough. And sweet is moly, but his root is ill. So every sweet with sour is tempered still, That make it be coveted the more. For easy things, that may be got at will, Most sorts of men do set but little store. Why then should I account of little pain, That endless pleasure shall unto me gain? 27. Note. Be seen appearing. Fair proud, now tell me, why should fair be proud? Sith all world's glory is but dross unclean, And in the shade of death itself shall shroud, However now thereof ye little ween. That goodly idol now so gay be seen Shall doff her flesh's borrowed fair attire, And be forgot as it had never been, That many now much worship and admire. Nay any then shall after it inquire, Nay any mention shall thereof remain, But what this verse that never shall expire Shall to you purchase with her thankless pain. Fair, be no linger proud of that shall perish, but that which shall you make immortal cherish. 28. Notes The badge which I do bear, as poet laureate, Lovely, loving. The laurel leaf which you this day do wear Gives me great hope of your relenting mind, For since it is the badge which I do bear, Ye, bearing it, do seem to me inclined. The power thereof, which oft in me I find, Let it likewise your gentle breast inspire With sweet infusion, And put you in mind of that proud maid Whom now those leaves attire. Proud Daphne, scorning Phoebus' lovely fire, On the Thessalian shore from him did fly, For which the gods in their revengeful ire did her transform into a laurel tree. Then fly no more, fair love, from Phoebus' chase, but in your breast is leaf and love and grace. 29. See how the stubborn damsel doth deprave my simple meaning with disdainful scorn, and by the bay which I unto her gave accounts myself her captive quite forlorn. The bay, quoth she, is of the victors born, Yielded them by the vanquished as their meads, And they therewith do poets' heads adorn To sing the glory of their famous deeds. But, sith she will the conquest challenge needs, Let her accept me as her faithful thrall, That her great triumph which my skill exceeds I may in trump of fame blaze over all. Then would I deck her head with glorious vase, and fill the world with her victorious praise. 30. Note. Delayed, tempered. My love is like to ice, and I to fire. How comes it then that this her cold so great is not dissolved through my so hot desire, but harder grows the more I her entreat? Or how comes it that my exceeding heat is not delayed by her heart frozen cold, but that I burn much more in boiling sweat and feel my flames augmented manifold? What more miraculous thing may be told that fire, which all things melts, should harden ice, and ice, which is congealed with senseless cold, should kindle fire by wonderful device? Such is the power of love in gentle mind, that it can alter all the course of kind. End of section one. Section two of Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Thirty one. Note. Scaff injury. 
Ah, oh, why hath nature to so hard a heart given so goodly gifts of beauty's grace, whose pride depraves each other better part, and all those precious ornaments deface? Sith to all other beasts of bloody race a dreadful countenance she given hath, that with their terror all the rest may chase and warn to shun the danger of their wrath. But my proud one doth work the greater scath Through sweet allurement of her lovely hue, That she the better may in bloody bath Of such poor thralls her cruel hands embrew. But did she know how ill these two accord, Such cruelty she would have soon abhorred. 32. The painful smith, with force of fervent heat, The hardest iron soon doth mollify that with his heavy sledge he can it beat and fashion to what he at list apply. Yet cannot all these flames in which I fry her heart more hard than iron soft a whit, nay all the plaints and prayers with which I do beat on Danville of her stubborn wit. But still the more she fervent sees my fit, the more she freezeth in her wilful pride, and harder grows the harder she is smit with all the plaints which to her be applied. What then remains but I to ashes burn, And she to stones at length all frozen turn? 33. Note. Ludwig is Ludwig Brisquet. <sighs> Great wrong I do, I can it not deny, To that most sacred empress, my dear dread, Not finishing her queen of fairy, That mote enlarge her living praises, dead. But Ludwig, this of grace to me a reed. Do ye not think the accomplishment of it sufficient work for one man's simple head? All were it as the rest, but rudely writ. How then should I, without another wit, think ever to endure so tedious toil, sith that this one is tossed with troublous fit of a proud love that doth my spirit spoil? Cease then, till she vouchsafe to grant me rest. Or lend you me another living breast. 34. Note. My helicy, i.e. sinosure. Like as a ship, that through the ocean wide, By conduct of some star, doth make her way, When as a storm hath dimmed her trusty guide, Out of her course doth wander far astray, So I, whose star that went with her bright ray to me to direct, with clouds is overcast, do wander now in darkness and dismay, through hidden perils round about me placed. Yet hope I well that when this storm is past, my helicy, the lodestar of my life, will shine again, and look on me at last, with lovely light to clear my cloudy grief. Till then I wander careful, comfortless, in secret sorrow, and sad pensiveness. 35. My hungry eyes, through greedy cover ties, still to behold the object of their pain, with no contentment can themselves suffice, but having pine, and having not, complain. For lacking it, they cannot life sustain, and having it, they gaze on it the more in their amazement like Narcissus vain, whose eyes him starve. So plenty makes me poor. Yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight that nothing else they brook, but loathe the things which they did like before, and can no more endure on them to look. All this world's glory seemeth vain to me, and all their shows but shadows, saving she. 36. Tell me, when shall these weary woes have end? Or shall their ruthless torment never cease, But all my days in pining languor spend Without hope of assuagement or release? Is there no means for me to purchase peace Or make agreement with her thrilling eyes, But that their cruelty doth still increase And daily more augment my miseries? But, when ye have shown all extremities, then think how little glory ye have gained by slaying him whose life, though ye despise, mote have your life in honour long maintained. But by his death, which some perhaps will moan, 
ye shall condemn it be of many a one. 37. What guile is this, that those her golden tresses she doth attire under a net of gold, and with sly skill so cunningly them dresses, that which is gold or hair may scarce be told? Is it that men's frail eyes, which gaze too bold, she may entangle in that golden snare, and being caught may craftily enfold their weaker hearts, which are not well aware? Take heed, therefore, mine eyes, how ye do stare henceforth too rashly on that guileful net, in which, if ever ye entrapped are, out of her bands ye by no means shall get. Fondness it were for any, being free, to covet fetters, though they golden be. 38. Orion when through tempest's cruel rack he forth was thrown into the greedy seas, through the sweet music which his harp did make, allured a dolphin him from death to ease. But my rude music, which was wont to please some dainty ears, cannot with any skill the dreadful tempest of her wrath appease, nor move the dolphin from her stubborn will. But in her pride she doth persever still, all careless how my life, for her decays yet with one word she can it save or spill to spill were pity but to save were praise choose rather to be praised for doing good than to be blamed for spilling guiltless blood thirty nine sweet smile the daughter of the queen of love expressing all thy mother's powerful art with which she wants to temper angry Jove when all the gods he threats with thundering dart. Sweet is thy virtue as thyself, sweetheart. For when on me thou shinest late in sadness, a melting pleasance ran through every part, and me revived with heart-robbing gladness. Whilst wrapped with joy resembling heavenly madness, my soul was ravished quite as in a trance and feeling thence no more her sorrow's sadness, fed on the fullness of that cheerful glance. More sweet than nectar, or ambrosial meat seemed every bit, which thenceforth I did eat. 40. Note. Mind four, and hundred graces. E. K., in his commentary on the shepherd's calendar, quotes a line closely resembling this from Spencer's pageants. An hundred graces on her eyelids sat. The same fancy occurs in the Fairy Queen and in the Hymn to Beauty. It is copied from a poem ascribed to Museus. C. Mark when she smiles with amiable cheer, and tell me whereto can ye liken it, when on each eyelid sweetly do appear an hundred graces as in shade to sit. Likest it seemeth in my simple wit unto the fair sunshine in summer's day, that when a dreadful storm away is flit, through the broad world doth spread his goodly ray. At sight whereof, each bird that sits on spray, and every beast that to his den was fled, comes forth afresh out of their late dismay, and to the light lift up their drooping head. So my storm-beaten heart likewise is cheered with that sunshine, when cloudy looks are cleared. 41. Is it her nature, or is it her will to be so cruel to an humbled foe? If nature, then she may it mend with skill. If will, then she at will may will forgo. But if her nature and her will be so, that she will plague the man that loves her most, and take delight in creeps a wretch's woe, then all her nature's goodly gifts are lost, and that same glorious beauty's idle boast is but a bait, such wretches to beguile, as being long in her love's tempest tossed, she means at last to make her piteous spoil. O oh, fairest fair, let never it be named that so fair beauty was so foully shamed. 42. The love which me so cruelly tormenteth, so pleasing is in my extremest pain, that all the more my sorrow it augmenteth, 
the more I love and do embrace my bane. Ne do I wish, for wishing were but vain, to be acquit for my continual smart, but joy her thrall for ever to remain, and yield for pledge my poor and captived heart, the which, that it from her may never start, let her, if please her, bind with adamant chain, and from all wandering loves which mote pervert his safe assurance, strongly it restrain. Only let her abstain from cruel tie, and do me not before my time to die. 43. Shall I then silent be, or shall I speak? And if I speak, her wrath renew I shall. And if I silent be, my heart will break, or choked be with overflowing gall. What tyranny is this, both my heart to thrall, and eke my tongue with proud restraint to tie, that neither I may speak nor think at all, but like a stupid stock in silence die? Yet I my heart with silence secretly will teach to speak, and my just cause to plead, and eke mine eyes with meek humility love learned letters to her eyes to read, which her deep wit, that true heart's thought can spell, will soon conceive and learn to construe well. 44. When those renowned noble peers of Greece, through stubborn pride among themselves did jar, forgetful of the famous golden fleece, then Orpheus with his harp their strife did bar. But this continual cruel civil war the which myself against myself do make, whilst my weak powers of passions wearied are, no skill can stint nor reason can aslake. But when in hand my tuneless harp I take, then do I more augment my foe's despite, and grief renew, and passions do awake to battle, fresh against myself to fight. Mongst whom the more I seek to settle peace, the more I find their malice to increase. 45. Note. Visnomy. Countenance. Leave, lady, in your glass of crystal clean your goodly self for evermore to view, and in myself, my inward self, I mean, most lively like, behold your semblant true. Within my heart, though hardly it can shew things so divine to view of earthly eye, the fair idea of your celestial hue and every part remains immortally. And were it not that, to your cruelty, with sorrow dimmed and deformed it were, the goodly image of your visnomy, clearer than crystal, would therein appear. But if yourself in me ye plain will see, Remove the cause by which your fair beams darkened be. 46. When my abode's prefixed time is spent, My cruel fair straight bids me wend my way, But then from heaven most hideous storms are sent, As willing me against her will to stay. Whom then shall I, or heaven, or her, obey? The heavens know best what is the best for me. But as she will, whose will my life doth sway, my lower heaven, so it perforce must be. But ye high heavens, that all this sorrow see, sith all your tempests cannot hold me back, assuage your storms, or else both you and she will both together me too sorely rack. Enough it is for one man to sustain the storms which she alone on me doth rain. 47. Trust not the treason of those smiling looks until ye have their guileful trains well tried, for they are like but unto golden hooks that from the foolish fish their baits do hide. So she with flattering smiles weak hearts doth guide unto her love, and tempt to their decay, whom, being caught, she kills with cruel pride, and feeds at pleasure on the wretched prey. Yet, even whilst her bloody hands them slay, her eyes look lovely, and upon them smile, that they take pleasure in their cruel play, and dying, 
to themselves a pain beguile. O oh, mighty charm, which makes men love their bane, and think they die with pleasure, live with pain. 48. Innocent paper, whom to cruel hand did make the matter to avenge her ire, and ere she could thy cause well understand, did sacrifice under the greedy fire. Well worthy thou to have found better hire than so bad end, for heretics ordained. Yet heresy nor treason did conspire, but plead thy maester's cause, unjustly painted, whom she, all careless of his grief, constrained to utter forth the anguish of his heart, and would not hear when he to her complained the piteous passion of his dying smart. Yet live for ever, though against her will, and speak her good, though she requited ill. 49. Fair cruel, why are you so fierce and cruel? Is it because your eyes have power to kill? Then know that mercy is the mighty's jewel, And greater glory think to save than spill. But if it be your pleasure and proud will To show the power of your imperious eyes, Then not on him that never thought you ill, But bend your force against your enemies. Let them feel the utmost of your cruelties, And kill with looks, as cockatrices do. But him that at your footstool humbled lies, with merciful regard gives mercy to. Such mercy shall you make admired to be, so shall you live by giving life to me. 50. Note. Prief. Proof. Experience. Long languishing in double malady of my heart's wound and of my body's grief, there came to me a leech that would apply fit medicines for my body's best relief. Vain man, quoth I, that hast but little brief in deep discovery of the mind's disease, is not the heart of all the body chief, and rules the members as itself doth please? Then with some cordials seek for to appease the inward languor of my wounded heart, and then my body shall have shortly ease. But such sweet cordials pass physician's art. Then, my life's leech, do you your skill reveal, And with one salve both heart and body heal. 51. Do I not see that fairest images Of hardest marble are of purpose made, For that they should endure through many ages, Now let their famous monuments to fade? Why then do I, untrained in lover's trade, Her hardness blame, which I should more commend? Sith never aught was excellent essayed, Which was not hard to achieve and bring to end. Ne aught so hard, but he that would attend, Mote soften it, and to his will allure. So do I hope her stubborn heart to bend, And that it then more steadfast will endure. Only my pains will be the more to get her, but having her, my joy will be the greater. 52. Notes. Sudden, perhaps sullen, dumps, lamentations. So oft as homeward I from her depart, I go like one that, having lost the field, is prisoner led away with heavy heart, despoiled of warlike arms and knowing shield. So do I now myself a prisoner yield To sorrow and to solitary pain From presence of my dearest dear exiled, Long while alone in languor to remain. There let no thought of joy or pleasure vain Dare to approach that may my solace breed, But sudden dumps and dreary sad disdain Of all world's gladness more my torment feed. So I her absence will my penance make, that of her presence I my meed may take. 53. Note. Fray. Frighten. The panther, 
knowing that his spotted hide doth please all beasts, but that his looks them fray, within a bush his dreadful head doth hide to let them gaze whilst he on them may prey. Right so my cruel fair with me doth play, for with the goodly semblance of her hue she doth allure me to mine own decay, and then no mercy will into issue. Great shame it is, things so divine in view, made for to be the world's most ornament, to make the bait her gazers to embrew. Good shames to be to ill an instrument, but mercy doth with beauty best agree, as in their maker ye them best may see. 54. Of this world's theatre in which we stay, my love, like the spectator, idly sits, beholding me that all the pageants play, disguising diversely my troubled wits. Sometimes I joy when glad occasion fits, and mask in mirth like to a comedy. Soon after, when my joy to sorrow flits, I wail and make my woes a tragedy. Yet she, beholding me with constant eye, delights not in my mirth, nor rues my smart. But when I laugh, she mocks, and when I cry, she laughs, and hardens evermore her heart. What then can move her, if nor mirth nor moan, she is no woman, but a senseless stone? 55. So oft as I her beauty to behold, and therefore do her cruelty compare, I marvel of what substance was the mould the which her made at once so cruel fair. Not earth, for her high thoughts more heavenly are. Not water, for her love doth burn like fire. Not air, for she is not so light or rare. Not fire, for she doth freeze with faint desire. Then needs another element inquire whereof she mote be made, that is, the sky. For to the heaven her haughty looks aspire, and eke her love is pure immortal high. Then sith to heaven ye likened are the best, be like in mercy, as in all the rest. 56. Fair ye be sure, but cruel and unkind, as is a tiger that with greediness hunts after blood, when he by chance doth find a feeble beast, doth felly him oppress. Fair be ye sure, but proud and pitiless, as is a storm that all things doth prostrate, finding a tree alone all comfortless, beats on it strongly it to ruinate. Fair be ye sure, but hard and obstinate, as is a rock amidst the raging floods, against which a ship of succor desolate doth suffer wreck both of herself and goods. That ship, that tree, and that same beast am I, whom ye do wreck, do ruin, and destroy. 57. Note. Stewers. Agitations. Sweet warrior, when shall I have peace with you? High time it is this war now ended were, which I no longer can endure to sue, nor your incessant battery more to bear. So weak my powers, so sore my wounds appear, that wonder is how I should live a jot, seeing my heart through lancet everywhere with thousand arrows which your eyes have shot. Yet shoot ye sharply still, and spare me not, but glory think to make these cruel stewers. Ye cruel one, what glory can be got in slaying him that would live gladly yours? Make peace, therefore, and grant me timely grace, that all my wounds will heal in little space. 58. Notes. In the phrase prefixed to this sonnet, by her, etc., by is perhaps a misprint for two, or this title may belong to Sonnet 59, H. Prayed, prayed upon. By her that is most assured to herself. Weak is the assurance that weak flesh reposeth in her own power, and scorneth others' aid. 
that soonest falls when as she most supposeth herself assured and is of naught afraid all flesh is frail and all her strength unstayed like a vain bubble blowing up with air devouring time and changeful chance have prayed her glorious pride that none may it repair ne none so rich or wise so strong or fair but faileth trusting on his own assurance and he that standeth on the highest stair falls lowest for on earth naught hath endurance why then do ye proud fair misdeem so far that to yourself ye most assured are fifty nine thrice happy she that is so well assured unto herself and settled so in heart that neither will for better be allured ne feared with worse to any chance to start but like a steady ship doth strongly part the raging waves and keeps her course aright ne aught for tempest doth from it depart ne aught for fairer weather's false delight such self-assurance need not fear the spite of grudging foes ne favour seek of friends but in the stay of her own steadfast might neither to one herself nor other bends most happy she that most assured doth rest but he most happy who such one loves best sixty note in line four as mars in threescore years i do not understand spencer's astronomy c they that in course of heavenly spheres are skilled to every planet point his sundry year in which her circle's voyage is fulfilled as mars in threescore years doth run his sphere so since the winged god his planet clear began in me to move one year is spent the which doth longer unto me appear than all those forty which my life outwent then by that count which lovers books invent the sphere of cupid forty years contains which i have wasted in long languishment that seemed the longer for my greater pains but let my love's fair planet short her ways this year ensuing or else short my days End of part two of Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. Section three of Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Sixty one. The glorious image of my Maker's beauty, my sovereign saint, the idol of my thought, dare not henceforth above the bounds of duty to accuse of pride or rashly blame for aught for being as she is divinely wrought and of the brood of angels heavenly born and with a crew of blessed saints upbrought each of which did her with their gifts adorn the bud of joy the blossom of the morn the beam of light whom mortal eyes admire what reason is it then but she should scorn base things that to her love too bold aspire such heavenly forms ought rather worshipped be than dare be loved by men of mean degree sixty two note blend blemish the weary year his race now having run the new begins his compassed course anew with show of morning mild he hath begun betokening peace and plenty to ensue so let us which this change of weather view change eke our minds and former lives amend the old year's sins for past let us eschew and fly the faults with which we did offend then shall the new year's joy forth freshly send into the glooming world his gladsome ray and all these storms which now his beauty blend shall turn to calms and timely clear away so likewise love cheer you your heavy sprite and change old years annoy to new delight sixty three after long storms and tempests sad to say which hardly i endured heretofore in dread of death and dangerous dismay with which my silly bark was tossed sore 
I do at length descry the happy shore, in which I hope ere long for to arrive. Fair soil it seems from far, and fraught with store of all that dear and dainty is alive. Most happy he that can at last achieve the joyous safety of so sweet a rest, whose least delight sufficeth to deprive remembrance of all pains which him oppressed. All pains are nothing in respect of this, all sorrows short that gain eternal bliss. 64. Note, Bellamours. I have not discovered what flower is here meant. See. Coming to kiss her lips, such grace I found, meseemed I smelt a garden of sweet flowers that dainty odors from them threw around, for damsels fit to deck their lovers' bowers. Her lips did smell like unto gilly flowers, her ruddy cheeks like unto roses red, her snowy brows like budded bellamours, her lovely eyes like pinks but newly spread, her goodly bosom like a strawberry bed, her neck like to a bunch of columbines, her breast like lilies ere their leaves be shed, her nipples like young blossom jessamines. Such fragrant flowers do give most odorous smell, but her sweet odor did them all excel. 65. The doubt which ye misdeem, fair love, is vain, that fondly fear to lose your liberty, when losing one, two liberties ye gain, and make him bond that bondage erst did fly. Sweet be the bands the which true love doth tie, without constraint or dread of any ill. The gentle bird feels no captivity within her cage, but sings and feeds her fill. There pride dare not approach, nor discord spill the league twixt them that loyal loveth bound. But simple truth and mutual good will seeks with sweet peace to salve each other's wound. Their faith doth fearless dwell in brazen tower, and spotless pleasure builds her sacred bower. 66. To all those happy blessings which ye have with plenteous hand by heaven upon your throne, this one disparagement they to you gave, that ye your love lent to so mean a one. Ye whose high worth's surpassing paragon could not on earth have found one fit for mate, ne but in heaven matchable to none, why did ye stoop unto so lowly state? But ye thereby much greater glory gate than had ye sorted with a prince's peer. For now your light doth more itself dilate, and in my darkness greater doth appear. Yet, since your light hath once illumined me, with my reflex, yours shall increase it be. 67. Like as a huntsman, after weary chase, seeing the game from him escaped away, sits down to rest him in some shady place, with panting hounds beguiled of their prey. So, after long pursuit and vain assay, when I all weary had the chase forsook, the gentle deer returned the selfsame way, thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. There she, beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide, till I in hand her yet half trembling took, and with her own good will her firmly tied. Strange thing me seemed to see a beast so wild, so goodly one, with her own will beguiled. 68. Note. Harrowed. Despoiled. Most glorious Lord of life, that on this day didst make thy triumph over death and sin, and having harrowed hell, didst bring away captivity, thence captive us to win, this joyous day, dear Lord, with joy begin, and grant that we for whom thou didst die, being with thy dear blood clean washed from sin, may live for ever in felicity, and that thy love we weighing worthily may likewise love thee for the same again, and for thy sake, that all like dear didst by, 
with love may one another entertain. So let us love, dear love, like as we ought. Love is the lesson which the Lord us taught. 69. The famous warriors of the antique world used trophies to erect in stately wise, in which they would the records have enrolled of their great deeds and valorous emprise. What trophy then shall I most fit devise, in which I may record the memory of my love's conquest, peerless beauty's prize, adorned with honour, love, and chastity? Even this verse, vowed to eternity, shall be thereof immortal monument, and tell her praise to all posterity that may admire such world's rare wonderment. The happy purchase of my glorious spoil, gotten at last, with labour and long toil. 70. Notes. Make, mate. Prime, spring. Fresh spring, the herald of love's mighty king, in whose coat armour richly are displayed all sorts of flowers, the which on earth do spring, in goodly colours, gloriously arrayed. Go to my love, where she is careless laid, yet in her winter's bower not well awake. Tell her the joyous time will not be stayed, unless she do him by the forelock take. Bid her therefore herself soon ready make to wait on love amongst his lovely crew, where every one that misseth then her make shall be by him immersed with penance due. Make haste therefore, sweet love, while it is prime, for none can call again the passed time. 71. I joy to see how in your draw and work yourself unto the bee you do compare, and me unto the spider that doth lurk in close await to catch her unaware. Right so yourself were caught in cunning snare of a dear foe, and thralled to his love, in whose straight bands ye now captivate are so firmly that ye never may remove. But as your work is woven all about with woodbind flowers and fragrant eglantine, so sweet your prison you in time shall prove, with many dear delights bedecked fine, and all thenceforth eternal peace shall see between the spider and the gentle bee. 72. Oft when my spirit doth spread her bolder wings in mind to mount up to the purest sky, it down is weighed with thought of earthly things, and clogged with burden of mortality. Where, when that sovereign beauty it doth spy, resembling heaven's glory in her light, drawn with sweet pleasure's bait it back doth fly, and unto heaven forgets her former flight. There my frail fancy fed with full delight, doth bathe in bliss, and mantleth most at ease. Ne thinks of other heaven, but how it might her heart's desire with most contentment please. Heart need not wish none other happiness, but here on earth to have such heaven's bliss. 73. Being myself captived here in care, my heart whom none with servile bands can tie but the fair tresses of your golden hair, breaking his prison, forth to you doth fly, like as a bird that in one's hand doth spy desired food, do it doth make his flight, even so my heart, that want on your fair eye to feed his fill, flies back unto your sight. Do you him take, and in your bosom bright gently in cage, that he may be your thrall, Perhaps he there may learn with rare delight to sing your name and praises over all, that he hereafter may you not repent him lodging in your bosom to have lent. 74. Most happy letters, framed by skilful trade, with which that happy name was first designed, the which three times thrice happy hath me made with gifts of body, fortune, and of mind. 
the first ray being to me gave by kind from mother's womb derived by due descent the second is my sovereign queen most kind that honour and large riches to me lent the third my love my life's last ornament by whom my spirit out of dust was raised to speak her praise and glory excellent of all alive most worthy to be praised ye three elizabeths for ever live that three such graces did unto me give seventy five one day i wrote her name upon the strand but came the waves and washed it away again i wrote it with a second hand but came the tide and made my pains his prey vain man said she that dost in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize for i myself shall like to this decay and eke my name be wiped out likewise not so quod i let baser things devise to die in dust but you shall live by fame my verse your virtues rare shall eternize and in the heavens write your glorious name where when as death shall all the world subdue our love shall live and later life renew seventy six fair bosom fraught with virtue's richest treasure the nest of love the lodging of delight the bower of bliss the paradise of pleasure the sacred harbour of that heavenly sprite how was i ravished with your lovely sight and my frail thoughts too rashly led astray whilst diving deep through amorous insight on the sweet spoil of beauty they did pray and twixt her paps like early fruit in may whose harvest seemed to hasten now apace they loosely did their wanton wings display and there to rest themselves did boldly place sweet thoughts I envy your so happy rest, which oft I wished, yet never was so blessed. 77. Note. Unvalued. Invaluable. Was it a dream? Or did I see it plain? A goodly table of pure ivory, all spread with junkets, fit to entertain the greatest prince with pompous royalty, amongst which there in a silver dish did lie two golden apples of unvalued price far passing those which hercules came by or those which atalanta did entice exceeding sweet yet void of sinful vice that many sought yet none could ever taste sweet fruit of pleasure brought from paradise by love himself and in his garden placed her breast that table was so richly spread my thoughts the guests which would thereon have fed seventy eight lacking my love i go from place to place like a young fawn that late hath lost the hind and seek each where where last i saw her face whose image yet i carry fresh in mind i seek the fields with her late footing signed I seek her bower with her late presence decked. Yet nor in field nor bower I can her find. Yet field and bower are full of her aspect. But when mine eyes I thereunto direct, They idly back return to me again. And when I hope to see their true object, I find myself but fed with fancies vain. Cease then mine eyes to seek herself to see, And let my thoughts behold herself in me seventy nine men call you fair and you do credit it for that yourself ye daily such to see but the true fair that is the gentle wit and virtuous mind is much more praised of me for all the rest however fair it be shall turn to naught and lose that glorious hue but only that is permanent and free from frail corruption that doth flesh ensue that is true beauty 
that doth argue you to be divine and born of heavenly seed derived from that fair spirit from whom all true and perfect beauty did at first proceed he only fair and what he fair hath made all other fair like flowers untimely fade eighty notes a soil discharge mew prison retreat after so long a race as i have run through fairyland which those six books compile give leave to rest me being half for done and gather to myself new breath awhile then as a steed refreshed after toil out of my prison i will break anew and stoutly will that second work a soil with strong endeavour and attention due till then Give leave to me in pleasant mew to sport my muse, and sing my love's sweet praise, the contemplation of whose heavenly hue my spirit to an higher pitch will raise. But let her praises yet be low and mean, fit for the handmaid of the fairy queen. 81 fair is my love when her fair golden hairs with the loose wind ye waving chance to mark fair when the rose in her red cheeks appears or in her eyes the fire of love does spark fair when her breast like a rich laden bark with precious merchandise she forth doth lay fair when that cloud of pride which oft doth dark her goodly light with smiles she drives away but fairest she when so she doth display the gate with pearls and rubies richly dight through which her words so wise do make their way to bear the message of her gentle sprite the rest be works of nature's wonderment but this the work of heart's astonishment eighty two note invent light upon find joy of my life full oft for loving you i bless my lot that was so lucky placed but then the more your own mishap i rue that are so much by so mean love embased for had the equal heavens so much you graced in this as in the rest ye mote invent some heavenly wit whose verse should have enchased your glorious name in golden monument but since ye deigned so goodly to relent to me your thrall in whom is little worth that little that i am shall all be spent in setting your immortal praises forth whose lofty argument uplifting me shall lift you up unto an high degree eighty three let not one spark of filthy lustful fire break out that may her sacred peace molest Ne one light glance of sensual desire attempt to work her gentle mind's unrest, but pure affections bred in spotless breast and modest thoughts breathe from well-tempered sprites go visit her in her chaste bower of rest, accompanied with angelic delights. There fill yourself with those most joyous sights the which myself could never yet attain. But speak no word to her of these sad plights which her too constant stiffness doth constrain. Only behold her rare perfection, and bless your fortune's fair election. 84. Notes. Mavis. Song Thrush. Entire. Inward. The world that cannot deem of worthy things when i do praise her say i do but flatter so does the cuckoo when the mavis sings begin his witless note apace to clatter but they that skill not of so heavenly matter all that they know not envy or admire rather than envy let them wonder at her but not to deem of her desert aspire deep in the closet of my parts entire her worth is written with a golden quill that me with heavenly fury doth inspire, and my glad mouth with her sweet praises fill, which, when as fame in her shrill trump shall thunder, let the world choose to envy or to wonder. 
85. Venomous tongue, tipped with vile adder's sting, of that self-kind with which the furies fell their snaky heads do comb, from which a spring of poisoned words and spiteful speeches well. Let all the plagues and horrid pains of hell upon thee fall for thine accursed hire, that with false forged lies which thou didst tell, in my true love did stir up coals of ire. The sparks whereof let kindle thine own fire, and catching hold on thine own wicked head, consume thee quite, that didst with guile conspire in my sweet peace such breaches to a bread. Shame be thy meed, and mischief thy reward, due to thyself that it for me prepared. 86. Since I did leave the presence of my love, many long weary days I have outworn, and many nights that slowly seemed to move their sad protract from evening until morn. For when as day the heaven doth adorn, I wish that night the noyous day would end, and when as night hath us of light forlorn, I wish that day would shortly reascend. Thus I the time with expectation spend, and feign my grief with changes to beguile, that further seems his term still to extend, and maketh every minute seem a mile. So sorrow still doth seem too long to last, but joyous hours do fly away too fast. 87 since I have lacked the comfort of that light the which was wont to lead my thoughts astray, I wander as in darkness of the night, afraid of every danger's least dismay. Nay, aught I see, though in the clearest day, when others gaze upon their shadows vain, but the only image of that heavenly ray whereof some glance doth in mine eye remain, of which, beholding the idea plain, through contemplation of my purest part, with light thereof I do myself sustain, and thereon feed my love a famished heart. But with such brightness whilst I fill my mind, I starve my body, and mine eyes do blind. 88. Notes. Culver, dove. Hove, hover, exist. Like as the culver on the buried bough sits mourning for the absence of her mate, and in her songs sends many a wishful vow for his return that seems to linger late, so I alone, now left disconsolate, mourn to myself the absence of my love, and wandering here and there all desolate, seek with my plaints to match that mournful dove, ne joy of aught that under heaven doth hove can comfort me, but her own joyous sight, whose sweet aspect both God and man can move, in her unspotted pleasance to delight. Dark is my day, while so fair light I miss, and dead my life that wants such lively bliss. End of section three. Section 4 of Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Epithalamian. For aesthetic reasons, the poem will be read twice. The first time without notes, the second with notes. Ye learned sisters, which have oftentimes been to me aiding others to adorn, whom ye thought worthy of your graceful rhymes, that even the greatest did not greatly scorn to hear their names sung in your simple lays, but joyed in their praise. And when ye list your own mishaps to mourn, which death or love or fortune's wreck did raise, your string could soon to sadder tenor turn, and teach the woods and waters to lament your doleful dreariment. Now lay those sorrowful complaints aside, and having all your heads with girlands crowned, help me mine own love's praises to resound, 
Now let the same of any be envied. So Orpheus did for his own bride, so I myself alone will sing. The woods shall to me answer, and my echo ring. Early, before the world's light-giving lamp, his golden beam upon the hills doth spread, having dispersed the night's uncheerful damp, do ye awake, and with fresh lusty head go to the bower of my beloved love, my truest turtle dove. Bid her awake, for Hymen is awake, and long since ready forth his mask to move, with his bright teed that flames with many a flake, and many a bachelor to wait on him in their fresh garments trim. Bid her awake, therefore, and soon her dight, for, lo, the wished day is come at last that shall for all the pains and sorrows past pay to her usury of long delight. And whilst she doth her dight, do ye to her of joy and solace sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Ring with you all the nymphs that you can hear, both of the rivers and the forests green, and of the sea that neighbours to her near, all with gay garlands goodly well beseen, and let them also with them bring in hand another gay garland, for my fair love of lilies and of roses, bound true love wise with a blue silk ribband, and let them make great store of bridal poses, and let them eke bring store of other flowers to deck the bridal bowers, and let the ground whereas her foot shall tread for fear the stones her tender foot should wrong, be strewed with fragrant flowers all along, and diapered like the discoloured mead. Which done, do at her chamber door await, for she will waken straight, the whiles do ye this song unto her sing, the woods shall to you answer, and your echo ring. Ye nymphs of Mulla, which with careful heed the silver scaly trouts do tend full well, and greedy pikes, which use therein to feed, those trouts and pikes all others do excel, and ye likewise which keep the rushy lake, where none do fishes take, bind up the locks the which hang scattered light, and in his waters which your mirror make, behold your faces as the crystal bright, that when you come whereas my love doth lie, no blemish ye may spy, and eke ye light-foot maids which keep the deer that on the hoary mountains used to tower, and the wild wolves which seek them to devour with your steel darts do chase from coming near, be also present here to help to deck her and to help to sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Wake now, my love, awake, for it is time, the rosy morn long since left Tython's bed, all ready to her silver coach to climb, and Phoebus skins to show his glorious head. Hark, how the cheerful birds do chant their lays, and carol of love's praise. The merry lark her matins sings aloft, the thrush replies, the mavis descant plays, the ousel shrills, the ruddock warbles soft. So goodly all agree with sweet consent to this day's merriment. Ah, my dear love, why do ye sleep thus long, when meeter were that ye should now awake to wait the coming of your joyous make, and hearken to the birds' love-learned song, the dewy leaves among? For they of joy and pleasance to you sing, that all the woods them answer and their echo ring. My love is now awake out of her dream, and her fair eyes, like stars that dimmed were with darksome cloud, now show their goodly beams more bright than Hesperus's head doth rear. Come now, ye damsels, daughters of delight, help quickly her to dight. But first come, ye fair hours, which were begot in Jove's sweet paradise of day and night, which to the seasons of the year allot, and all that ever in this world is fair, to make and still repair. And ye, three handmaids of the Cyprian queen, the which do still adorn her beauty's pride, help to adorn my beautifulest bride, and as ye her array, still throw between some graces to be seen, and as ye use to Venus, to her sing, the whiles the wood shall answer, and your echo ring. Now is my love all ready forth to come, 
Let all the virgins therefore well await, and ye fresh boys that tend upon her groom, prepare yourselves, for he is coming straight. Set all your things in seemly good array, fit for so joyful day. The joyfulst day that ever sun did see. Fair sun, show forth thy favourable ray, and let thy lifeful heat not fervent be, for fear of burning her sunshiny face, her beauty to disgrace. O oh, fairest Phoebus, father of the muse, if ever I did honour thee aright, or sing the thing that mote thy mind delight, do not thy servants simple boon refuse, but let this day, let this one day be mine, let all the rest be thine. Then I thy sovereign praises loud will sing, that all the woods shall answer, and their echo ring. Hark how the minstrels gin to shrill aloud their merry music that resounds from far, the pipe, the tabor, and the trembling crowd that well agree without in breach or jar. But most of all the damsels do delight when they their timbrels smite, and thereunto do dance and carol sweet, that all the senses they do ravish quite, the whiles the boys run up and down the street, crying aloud with strong confused noise, as if it were one voice, Hymen, your Hymen, Hymen, they do shout, that even to the heavens their shouting shrill doth reach, and all the firmament doth fill to which the people, standing all about, as in approvance, do thereto applaud, and loud advance her laud, and evermore they hymen, hymen sing, that all the woods them answer, and their echo ring. Lo, where she comes along with portly pace, like Phoebe, from her chamber of the east, arising forth to run her mighty race, clad all in white that seems a virgin best, so well it her beseems that ye would ween some angel she had been. Her long, loose, yellow locks like golden wire sprinkled with pearl, and pearling flowers atween, do like a golden mantle her attire, and being crowned with a girland green, seem like some maiden queen. Her modest eyes, abashed to behold so many gazers as on her do stare, upon the lowly ground affixed are ne dare lift up her countenance too bold, but blush to hear her praises sung so loud, so far from being proud. Nathless do ye still loud her praises sing, that all the woods may answer, and your echo ring. Tell me, ye merchants' daughters, did ye see so fair a creature in your town before, so sweet, so lovely, and so mild as she, adorned with beauty's grace and virtue's store her goodly eyes like sapphires shining bright her forehead ivory white her cheeks like apples which the sun hath redded her lips like cherries charming men to bite her breast like to a bowl of cream uncrudded her paps like lilies budded her snowy neck like to a marble tower and all her body like a palace fair ascending up with many a stately stair to honour's seat and chastity's sweet bower why stand ye still ye virgins in amaze upon her so to gaze whiles ye forget your former lay to sing to which the woods did answer and your echo ring but if ye saw that which no eyes can see the inward beauty of her lively sprite garnished with heavenly gifts of high degree much more then would ye wonder at that sight, and stand astonished like to those which read Medusa's mazeful head. There dwells sweet love and constant chastity, unspotted faith and comely womanhood, regard of honour and mild modesty. There virtue reigns as queen in royal throne, and giveth laws alone, the which the base affections do obey, and yield their services unto her will. Ne thought of things uncomely ever may the two approach to tempt her mind to ill. Had ye once seen these her celestial treasures and unrevealed pleasures, then would ye wonder and her praises sing that all the woods should answer and your echo ring. Open the temple gates unto my Louvre, 
Open them wide that she may enter in, and all the posts adorn as doth behoove, and all the pillars deck with girlands trim, for to receive this saint with honour due that cometh in to you. With trembling steps and humble reverence she cometh in before the Almighty's view. Of her ye virgins learn obedience, when so ye come into those holy places to humble your proud faces. Bring her up to thy altar, that she may the sacred ceremonies there partake, the which do endless matrimony make. And let the roaring organs loudly play the praises of the Lord in lively notes, the whiles with hollow throats the choristers the joyous anthem sing, that all the woods may answer and their echo ring. Behold, while she before the altar stands, hearing the holy priest that to her speaks, and blesseth her with his two happy hands, how the red roses flush up in her cheeks, and the pure snow with goodly vermil stain, like crimson dyed in grain, that even the angels which continually about the sacred altar do remain, forget their service, and about her fly, oft peeping in her face, that seems more fair the more they on it stare. But her sad eyes, still fastened on the ground, are governed with goodly modesty that suffers not one look to glance awry, which may let in a little thought unsound. Why blush ye, love, to give to me your hand, the pledge of all our band? Sing, ye sweet angels, alleluia sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Now all is done. Bring home the bride again. Bring home the triumph of our victory. Bring home with you the glory of her game, with joyance bring her, and with jollity. Never had man more joyful day than this, whom heaven would heap with bliss. Make feast, therefore, now all this live-long day. This day forever to me holy is. Pour out the wine without restraint or stay. Pour not by cups, but by the bellyful. Pour out to all that wool and sprinkle all the posts and walls with wine, that they may sweat and drunken be withal. Crown ye God Bacchus with a coronal, and Hymen also crown with wreaths of vine, and let the graces dance unto the rest, for they can do it best, the whiles the maidens do their carol sing, to which the woods shall answer, and their echo ring. Ring ye the bells, ye young men of the town, and leave your wanted labours for this day. This day is holy, do ye write it down, that ye for ever it remember may. This day the sun is in his chiefest height, with Barnaby the bright, from whence declining daily by degrees, he somewhat loseth of his heat and light, when once the crab behind his back he sees. But for this time, it ill-ordained was to choose the longest day in all the year, and shortest night, when longest fitter were, yet never a day so long but late would pass. Ring ye the bells to make it wear away, and bonfires make all day, and dance about them, and about them sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Ah, when will this long weary day have end? and lend me leave to come unto my love. How slowly do the hours their numbers spend! How slowly does sad time his feathers move! Haste thee, O fairest planet, to thy home within the western foam! Thy tired steeds long since have need of rest. Long though it be, at last I see it gloom, and the bright evening star with golden crest appear out of the east. Fair child of beauty, glorious lamp of love, that all the host of heaven in ranks dost lead, and guidest lovers through the night's sad treed, how cheerfully thou lookest from above, and seemst to laugh atween thy twinkling light, as joying in the sight of these glad many which for joy do sing, that all the woods them answer and their echo ring. Now cease, ye damsels, your delights forepast, 
Enough it is that all the day was yours. Now day is done, and night is nighing fast. Now bring the bride unto the bridal bowers. The night is come. Now soon her disarray, and in her bed her lay. Lay her in lilies and in violets, and silken curtains over her display, and odoured sheets, and arras coverlets. Behold, how goodly my fair love does lie, in proud humility, like unto Maia, when as Jove her took in Tempe, lying on the flowery grass, twixt sleep and wake, after she weary was with bathing in the Acidalian brook. Now it is night, ye damsels may be gone, and leave my love alone, and leave likewise your former lay to sing. The woods no more shall answer, nor your echo ring. Now, welcome, night, thou night so long expected, that long day's labour dost at last defray and all my cares which cruel love collected hast summed in one and cancelled for a spread thy broad wing over my love and me that no man mayest see and in thy sable mantle us enwrap from fear of peril and foul horror free let no false treason seek us to entrap nor any dread disquiet once annoy the safety of our joy but let the night be calm and quietsome, without tempestuous storms or sad affray, like as when Jove with fair Alcmena lay when he begot the great Tyrinthian groom, or like as when he with thyself did lie and begot Majesty. And let the maids and young men cease to sing, nor let the woods them answer, nor their echo ring. Let no lamenting cries nor doleful tears be heard all night within, nor yet without. Now let false whispers, breeding hidden fears, break gentle sleep and misconceived doubt. Let no deluding dreams nor dreadful sights make sudden sad affrights. Now let house fires nor lightnings helpless harms. Now let the puck nor other evil sprites. Now let mischievous witches with their charms, Now let hobgoblins, names whose sense we see not, Fray us with things that be not. Let not the screech-owl nor the stork be heard, Nor the night-raven that still deadly yells, Nor damned ghosts called up with mighty spells, Nor grisly vultures make us once afeard. Now let the unpleasant choir of frogs still croaking Make us to wish their choking. Let none of these their dreary accents sing, Nor let the woods them answer, nor their echo ring. But let still silence true night watches keep, That sacred peace may in assurance reign, And timely sleep, when it is time to sleep, May pour his limbs forth on your pleasant plain. The whiles an hundred little winged loves, like divers feathered doves, shall fly and flutter round about the bed, and in the secret dark that none reproves, their pretty stealths shall work and snares shall spread to filch away sweet snatches of delight, concealed through covert night. Ye sons of Venus, play your sports at will. For greedy pleasure, careless of your toys, Thinks more upon her paradise of joys Than what ye do, albeit good or ill. All night, therefore, attend your merry play, For it will soon be day. Now none doth hinder you that say or sing, Ne will the woods now answer, nor your echo ring. Who is the same which at my window peeps? Or whose is that fair face that shines so bright? Is it not Cynthia, she that never sleeps, But walks about high heaven all the night? O fairest goddess, do thou not envy my love with me to spy? For thou likewise didst love, though now in thought, And for a fleece of wool, which privily the Latmian shepherd Once unto thee brought, his pleasures with thee wrought. Therefore, to us be favourable now, and sith of women's labours thou hast charge, and generation goodly dost enlarge, incline thy will to effect our wishful vow, 
and the chaste womb inform with timely seed that may our comfort breed till which we cease our hopeful hap to sing nay let the woods us answer nor our echo ring and thou great juno which with awful might the laws of wedlock still dost patronize and the religion of the faith first plight with sacred rites has taught to solemnize and eke for comfort often called art of women in their smart eternally bind thou this lovely band and all thy blessings unto us impart and thou glad genius in whose gentle hand the bridal bower and genial bed remain without blemish or stain and the sweet pleasures of their love's delight with secret aid dost succour and supply till they bring forth the fruitful progeny send us the timely fruit of this same night and thou fair hebe and thou hymen free grant that it may so be till which we cease your further praise to sing ne any woods shall answer nor your echo ring and ye high heavens the temple of the gods in which a thousand torches flaming bright do burn that to us wretched earthly clods in dreadful darkness lent desired light and all ye powers which in the same remain more than we men can feign pour out your blessing on us plenteously and happy influence upon us reign that we may raise a large posterity which from the earth which they may long possess with lasting happiness up to your haughty palaces may mount and for the guerdon of their glorious merit may heavenly tabernacles there inherit of blessed saints for to increase the count so let us rest sweet love in hope of this and cease till then our timely joys to sing the woods no more us answer nor our echo ring song made in you of many ornaments with which my love should duly have been decked which cutting off through hasty accidents ye would not stay your due time to expect but promised both to recompense be unto her a goodly ornament and for short time an endless monument here follows a second reading of epithalamion with notes each note prefixed to the stanza to which it pertains ye learned sisters which have oftentimes been to me aiding others to adorn whom ye thought worthy of your graceful rhymes that even the greatest did not greatly scorn to hear their names sung in your simple lays but joyed in their praise and when ye list your own mishaps to mourn which death or love or fortune's wreck did raise your string could soon to sadder tenor turn and teach the woods and waters to lament your doleful dreariment now lay those sorrowful complaints aside and having all your heads with girlands crowned help me mine own love's praises to resound now let the same of any be envied so orpheus did for his own bride so i myself alone will sing the woods shall to me answer and my echo ring notes on the following stanza teed torch dight deck early before the world's light-giving lamp his golden beam upon the hills doth spread having dispersed the night's uncheerful damp do ye awake and with fresh lusty head go to the bower of my beloved love my truest turtle dove bid her awake for hymen is awake and long since ready forth his mask to move with his bright teed that flames with many a flake and many a bachelor to wait on him in their fresh garments trim bid her awake therefore and soon her dight for lo the wished day is come at last that shall for all the pains and sorrows past pay to her usury of long delight and whilst she doth her dight do ye to her of joy and solace sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring notes be seen adorned diapered variegated 
bring with you all the nymphs that you can hear, both of the rivers and the forests green, and of the sea that neighbors to her near, all with gay garlands goodly well beseen, and let them also with them bring in hand another gay garland for my fair love of lilies and of roses bound true love wise with a blue silk riband and let them make great store of bridal poses and let them eke bring store of other flowers to deck the bridal bowers and let the ground whereas her foot shall tread for fear the stones her tender foot should wrong be strewed with fragrant flowers all along and diapered like the discoloured mead which done do at her chamber door await for she will waken straight the whiles do ye this song unto her sing the woods shall to you answer and your echo ring ye nymphs of mulla which with careful heed the silver scaly trouts do tend full well and greedy pikes which use therein to feed those trouts and pikes all others do excel and ye likewise which keep the rushy lake where none do fishes take bind up the locks the which hang scattered light and in his waters which your mirror make behold your faces as the crystal bright that when you come whereas my love doth lie no blemish ye may spy and eke ye light-foot maids which keep the deer that on the hoary mountains use to tower and the wild wolves which seek them to devour with your steel darts do chase from coming near be also present here to help to deck her and to help to sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring notes mavis song thrush descant variation ousel blackbird ruddock redbreast make mate wake now my love awake for it is time the rosy morn long since left tython's bed all ready to her silver coach to climb and Phoebus skins to show his glorious head. Hark! How the cheerful birds do chant their lays, And carol of love's praise. The merry lark her matins sings aloft, The thrush replies, The mavis descant plays, The ousel shrills, The ruddock warbles soft. So goodly all agree with sweet consent To this day's merriment. Ah, my dear love, why do ye sleep thus long, When meeter were that ye should now awake, to wait the coming of your joyous make, and hearken to the birds' love-learned song, the dewy leaves among. For they of joy and pleasance to you sing, that all the woods them answer, and their echo ring. My love is now awake out of her dream, and her fair eyes, like stars that dimmed were with darksome cloud, now show their goodly beams more bright than Hesperus's head doth rear. Come now, ye damsels, daughters of delight, help quickly her to dight. But first come, ye fair hours, which were begot in Jove's sweet paradise of day and night, which do the seasons of the year allot, and all that ever in this world is fair, do make and still repair. And ye, three handmaids of the Cyprian queen, the which do still adorn her beauty's pride, help to adorn my beautifulest bride and as ye her array still throw between some graces to be seen and as ye use to venus to her sing the whiles the wood shall answer and your echo ring now is my love all ready forth to come let all the virgins therefore well await and ye fresh boys that tend upon her groom prepare yourselves for he is coming straight Set all your things in seemly good array, fit for so joyful day. The joyfulst day that ever sun did see. Fair sun, show forth thy favourable ray, and let thy lifeful heat not fervent be, for fear of burning her sunshiny face, her beauty to disgrace. O oh, fairest Phoebus, father of the muse, if ever I did honour thee aright, or sing the thing that mote thy mind delight, do not thy servants simple boon refuse, but let this day, let this one day be mine, let all the rest be thine. Then I thy sovereign praises loud will sing, that all the woods shall answer, and their echo ring.
Note. Crowd. Violin. Hark how the minstrels gin to shrill aloud their merry music that resounds from far, the pipe, the tabor, and the trembling crowd that well agree without an breach or jar. But most of all the damsels do delight when they their timbrels smite, and thereunto do dance and carol sweet, that all the senses they do ravish quite, the whiles the boys run up and down the street, crying aloud with strong confused noise, as if it were one voice, Hymen, yo Hymen, Hymen, they do shout, that even to the heavens their shouting shrill doth reach, and all the firmament doth fill. To which the people, standing all about, as in approvance, do thereto applaud, and loud advance her laud, and evermore they hymen, hymen sing, that all the woods them answer, and their echo ring. Lo, where she comes along with portly pace, like Phoebe, from her chamber of the east, arising forth to run her mighty race, clad all in white that seems a virgin best, so well it her beseems that ye would ween some angel she had been. Her long, loose, yellow locks, like golden wire sprinkled with pearl, and pearling flowers atween, do like a golden mantle her attire, and, being crowned with a girland green, seem like some maiden queen. Her modest eyes, abashed to behold so many gazers as on her do stare, upon the lowly ground a fixed are, ne dare lift up her countenance too bold, but blush to hear her praises sung so loud, so far from being proud. Nathless, do ye still loud her praises sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Note. Uncrudded, uncurdled. In your town, the marriage seems to have taken place in Cork, and we might infer from this passage that the heroine of the song was a merchant's daughter. See. Tell me, ye merchants' daughters, did ye see so fair a creature in your town before, so sweet, so lovely, and so mild as she, adorned with beauty's grace and virtue's store? Her goodly eyes, like sapphires shining bright, her forehead ivory white, her cheeks like apples which the sun hath redded, her lips like cherries charming men to bite, her breast like to a bowl of cream uncrudded, her paps like lilies budded, her snowy neck like to a marble tower, and all her body like a palace fair, ascending up with many a stately stair to honour's seat and chastity's sweet bower. Why stand ye still, ye virgins, in amaze upon her so to gaze, whilst ye forget your former lay to sing, to which the woods did answer, and your echo ring? Note. Read. Saw. But if ye saw that which no eyes can see, the inward beauty of her lively sprite, garnished with heavenly gifts of high degree, much more then would ye wonder at that sight, and stand astonished like to those which read Medusa's mazeful head. There dwells sweet love and constant chastity, unspotted faith and comely womanhood, regard of honour and mild modesty there virtue reigns as queen in royal throne and giveth laws alone the which the base affections do obey and yield their services unto her will ne thought of things uncomely ever may the two approach to tempt her mind to ill had ye once seen these her celestial treasures and unrevealed pleasures then would ye wonder and her praises sing that all the woods should answer and your echo ring open the temple gates unto my louvre open them wide that she may enter in and all the posts adorn as doth behoove and all the pillars deck with girlands trim for to receive this saint with honour due that cometh in to you with trembling steps and humble reverence she cometh in before the Almighty's view. Of her, ye virgins, learn obedience, when so ye come into those holy places to humble your proud faces. Bring her up to thy altar, that she may the sacred ceremonies there partake, the which do endless matrimony make. 
and let the roaring organs loudly play the praises of the Lord in lively notes, the whiles with hollow throats the choristers the joyous anthem sing, that all the woods may answer and their echo ring. Note, sad, serious. Behold, while she before the altar stands, hearing the holy priest that to her speaks, and blesseth her with his two happy hands, how the red roses flush up in her cheeks, and the pure snow with goodly vermil stain, like crimson dyed in grain, that even the angels which continually about the sacred altar do remain, forget their service, and about her fly, oft peeping in her face, that seems more fair the more they on it stare. But her sad eyes, still fastened on the ground, are governed with goodly modesty, that suffers not one look to glance awry, which may let in a little thought unsound. Why blush ye, love, to give to me your hand, the pledge of all our band? Sing, ye sweet angels, alleluia sing, that all the woods may answer, and your echo ring. Note. Wool, will. Now all is done. Bring home the bride again. Bring home the triumph of our victory. Bring home with you the glory of her game. With joyance bring her, and with jollity. Never had man more joyful day than this, whom heaven would heap with bliss. Make feast, therefore, now all this live-long day. This day for ever to me holy is. Pour out the wine without restraint or stay. Pour not by cups, but by the bellyful. Pour out to all that wool, and sprinkle all the posts and walls with wine, that they may sweat and drunken be withal. Crown ye God Bacchus with a coronal, and Hymen also crowned with wreaths of vine, and let the graces dance unto the rest, for they can do it best, the whiles the maidens do their carol sing, to which the woods shall answer, and their echo ring. Note, Barnaby the Bright the difference between the old and new style at the time this poem was written was ten days. The summer solstice, therefore, fell on St. Barnabas's day, the 11th of June. C. Ring ye the bells, ye young men of the town, and leave your wanted labors for this day. This day is holy, do ye write it down, that ye for ever it remember may. This day the sun is in his chiefest height, with Barnaby the bright, from whence declining daily by degrees, he somewhat loseth of his heat and light, when once the crab behind his back he sees. But for this time it ill-ordained was to choose the longest day in all the year, and shortest night, when longest fitter were, yet never day so long but late would pass. Ring ye the bells to make it wear away, and bonfires make all day, and dance about them, and about them sing, that all the woods may answer and your echo ring. Ah, when will this long weary day have end, and lend me leave to come unto my Louvre? How slowly do the hours their numbers spend, how slowly does sad time his feathers move. Haste thee, O fairest planet, to thy home within the western foam. Thy tired steeds long since have need of rest. Long though it be, at last I see it gloom, and the bright evening star with golden crest appear out of the east. Fair child of beauty, glorious lamp of love, that all the host of heaven in ranks dost lead, and guidest lovers through the night's sad treed, how cheerfully thou lookest from above, and seemst to laugh atween thy twinkling light, as joying in the sight of these glad many which for joy do sing, that all the woods them answer and their echo ring. Now cease, ye damsels, your delights forepast. Enough it is that all the day was yours. Now day is done, and night is nighing fast. Now bring the bride unto the bridal bowers. The night is come, now soon her disarray, and in her bed her lay. 
lay her in lilies and in violets, and silken curtains over her display, and odoured sheets, and arras coverlets. Behold, how goodly my fair love does lie, in proud humility, like unto Maia, when as Jove her took in Tempe, lying on the flowery grass, twixt sleep and wake after she weary was with bathing in the Acidalian brook. Now it is night, ye damsels may be gone, and leave my love alone, and leave likewise your former lay to sing. The woods no more shall answer, nor your echo ring. Now, welcome, night, thou night so long expected, that long day's labour dost at last defray and all my cares which cruel love collected hast summed in one and cancelled for a spread thy broad wing over my love and me that no man mayest see and in thy sable mantle us enwrap from fear of peril and foul horror free let no false treason seek us to entrap nor any dread disquiet once annoy the safety of our joy but let the night be calm and quietsome, without tempestuous storms or sad affray, like as when Jove with fair Alcmena lay when he begot the great Tyrinthian groom, or like as when he with thyself did lie and begot Majesty. And let the maids and young men cease to sing, nor let the woods them answer, nor their echo ring. Note the puck, a puck is a generic term signifying fiend or mischievous imp, is Robin Goodfellow, C. Let no lamenting cries nor doleful tears be heard all night within, nor yet without. Now let false whispers, breeding hidden fears, break gentle sleep and misconceived doubt. Let no deluding dreams nor dreadful sights make sudden sad affrights, now let house-fires nor lightnings helpless harms, now let the puck nor other evil sprites, now let mischievous witches with their charms, now let hobgoblins, names whose sense we see not, fray us with things that be not. Let not the screech-owl nor the stork be heard, nor the night-raven that still deadly yells, nor damned ghosts called up with mighty spells, nor grisly vultures make us once afeard. Now let the unpleasant choir of frogs still croaking make us to wish their choking. Let none of these their dreary accents sing, now let the woods them answer, nor their echo ring. But let still silence true night watches keep, that sacred peace may in assurance reign, and timely sleep, when it is time to sleep, may pour his limbs forth on your pleasant plain, the whiles an hundred little winged loves, like divers feathered doves, shall fly and flutter round about the bed, and in the secret dark that none reproves, their pretty stealths shall work, and snares shall spread, to filch away sweet snatches of delight, concealed through covert night ye sons of venus play your sports at will for greedy pleasure careless of your toys thinks more upon her paradise of joys than what ye do albeit good or ill all night therefore attend your merry play for it will soon be day now none doth hinder you that say or sing nor will the woods now answer nor your echo ring Note, the Latmian shepherd, Endymion. Who is the same which at my window peeps? Or whose is that fair face that shines so bright? Is it not Cynthia, she that never sleeps, but walks about high heaven all the night? O fairest goddess, do thou not envy my love with me to spy? For thou likewise didst love, though now in thought and for a fleece of wool which privily the latmian shepherd once unto thee brought his pleasures with thee wrought therefore to us be favourable now and sith of women's labours thou hast charge and generation goodly dost enlarge incline thy will to effect our wishful vow 
and the chaste womb inform with timely seed that may our comfort breed till which we cease our hopeful hap to sing nay let the woods us answer nor our echo ring and thou great juno which with awful might the laws of wedlock still dost patronize and the religion of the faith first plight with sacred rites has taught to solemnize and eke for comfort often called art of women in their smart eternally bind thou this lovely band and all thy blessings unto us impart and thou glad genius in whose gentle hand the bridal bower and genial bed remain without blemish or stain and the sweet pleasures of their love's delight with secret aid dost succour and supply till they bring forth the fruitful progeny send us the timely fruit of this same night and thou fair hebe and thou hymen free grant that it may so be till which we cease your further praise to sing ne any woods shall answer nor your echo ring and ye high heavens the temple of the gods in which a thousand torches flaming bright do burn that to us wretched earthly clods in dreadful darkness lent desired light and all ye powers which in the same remain more than we men can feign pour out your blessing on us plenteously and happy influence upon us reign that we may raise a large posterity which from the earth which they may long possess with lasting happiness up to your haughty palaces may mount and for the guerdon of their glorious merit may heavenly tabernacles there inherit of blessed saints for to increase the count so let us rest sweet love in hope of this and cease till then our timely joys to sing the woods no more us answer nor our echo ring song made in you of many ornaments with which my love should duly have been decked which cutting off through hasty accidents ye would not stay your due time to expect but promised both to recompense be unto her a goodly ornament and for short time an endless monument. End of Amoretti and Epithalamian by Edmund Spencer. Read by Thomas Copeland.